Well, I guess it's time to start. My name's John Papa, and you may be wondering why I'm wearing orange sunglasses inside. I was dared on Twitter to start the session like this, so I had to do it. You better get your picture now, because I can't see a darn thing. <laughs> Actually, if I could see through them, I'd keep wearing them. Uh, anyway, so this session here is about single page applications with Microsoft ASP.NET. And we've got a little over an hour to talk about kind of what SPA is, how those things come together, when you might want to choose to create a SPA, when you might not want to. We'll talk about some of the options that you have in creating one, and I'll show you some samples that I've created that show you some things that you can do with it. And along the way, instead of teaching you everything about SPA, because quite frankly that would take several hours, I'm going to teach you what I think are the three most important features of a SPA and different tools that you can use to build a SPA. And then we'll actually go and build one using some of the Visual Studio SPA templates. Before we begin, how many of you here have built a SPA or any kind of a JavaScript heavy client before? Okay, a good portion of you. Uh, how many of you here have never heard of SPA? A couple of people. Okay, good. So we'll have a little overview in the beginning of what a SPA is, and quite frankly, even a lot of people who know what SPA is have a hard time articulating it, because SPA is a terrible, terrible name for this thing. It's a single page app. Well, wait a minute, I build apps that have 20 screens in them or 200 screens. That means SPA's not for me, right? Well, no. Single page really just means it's a single HTML rendering from the server to the client. But then once you get on that client, you can have your 100 screens if you want to. So SPA is a really terrible name. And we were joking around on Twitter about what other names we could use. And quite frankly, none of them worked. So SPA is the name that we have. Let's just live with it. So we're talking about going to the SPA. And a couple of you might want to do that here. We're in New Orleans. Could be kind of interesting. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to find a picture of a spa that I could actually show a tech ed. <laughs> so a spa is what? It's a web app. It's going to fit on a single web page. There's that single word again. It's going to fit on a single HTML page, basically, providing a very fluid user experience. We like those words like fluid and immersive here. By loading all the necessary code with a single page. It's really important to grok what this means. We've got a single application. All your presentation logic is now on the client. This does not mean your business logic goes to the client. This does not mean your security gets written in JavaScript. All the stuff that normally would sit in the back end still stays in the back end. It's just with SPA, what you're keeping on the client is the presentation logic. For example, if you were going to Amazon or any other place to buy something, how would the experience be if it, when you search for an item, and then you select the item, and then you enter the how many items you want, and then you enter your credit card. If all those were different page refreshes every single time that you did anything, and it took like 20 page refreshes to hit, yeah, I want to buy it. That wouldn't be a great user experience. And quite frankly, I assume whatever shopping cart system that would be probably would lose business over that. Wouldn't it be great if you could consolidate that down to, you know what? I'm only changing a little bit on the screen from place to place. Why do I have to re-render the entire page? If somebody selects something, then maybe I should have just go get the rest of that information and put it in some kind of a div or some kind of window right below that information. A SPA can help us get there by making a much better user experience. So why would you want to build one? Because John Papa said so. And then after you say, yeah, right, but anyway, uh, I talk about the three R's in SPA. And if you want reach, reach meaning you want to cross multiple devices. Have any of you been asked, and probably have, from one of your bosses or clients. I'd like an app that, by the way, should run on all flavors of Android and Windows Phone and Windows 8 and iOS and everywhere. I want to build one of those apps, and I want to write it 20 times. How do you do that? How can you reach all those devices? Well, HTML5, the concept, works that way. And that's what SPA is built on. You can use HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It doesn't have to be HTML5. It just has to be modern HTML. HTML4 works with it can render up to the client for you. And then you can reach multiple devices. What do you want with that rich user experience? We just talked about a situation like that, where you want to have the user have a really positive experience on the web page in your application. And reduced round tripping, that's really the key. Why do you have to go back to the server to get everything every time, when maybe just a little bit of data changes each time? 
And I know that's four R's, but bear with me. So if you got those three things, spa's a good choice. If you don't care about those three, then don't build a spa. Let's be very frank. There is no technology today that no matter what I'm building and where I'm putting it, I'm using this technology. That doesn't exist. If it did, that company would be rich, more rich than we would. We have choices, and spa is a choice for these situations. So common traits, we mentioned a couple things here, but some additional ones are you want to have navigation and history and deep linking. Maybe you're writing some kind of business app, you want to link right to a specific page for a specific customer on their order. You can do that with a spa. We've got this thing called the address bar inside the browser, and we can use that to go right to a particular place in our application. We can intercept that address as well to go from page to page. Now, when I say pages inside of a spa, what I'm actually referring to are views that I've preloaded in the spa in the browser. And those views are going to be maybe one to n number of views. Those views will be on the browser already, and we'll just show and hide them as needed without going back to the server. And that's where navigation comes in. And we can link right into the history of the browser. You want to persist state in the client? Spa can do that too. We've got about seven different ways to do it, depending upon what you want to accomplish. Everything from local databases all the way down to just like key dictionary items. You're going to mostly load on your initial page with a spa. Now, the spa, you don't necessarily want to load everything up front. What I usually look at is what are the main use cases that the people using this app are going to use right away. If I open up my app, they're always going to open on the dashboard and then go right into some kind of reporting or customer information. I'm going to load that data first and those views. Even if they're not directly visible, because I know that's what my users do, that's how they work. And that gets into a couple of important points about user experience. Know what your business needs are. How do your users use the app? Once you know that, you know what to load in your spa first. And this is not unique to spa. Any kind of application, you want to know what are the users going to do so I can get that stuff ready. If there's some very infrequently used screens, like admin screens that aren't going to be used quite often, don't load those up front. Don't go get their data. And by doing that, putting the things up front first, the user takes a minor hit up front to get the data one time in the screens, but then they can whip around the app really quickly because you've got it. And progressively download the rest as required. So once you do go to those other infrequently used screens, that's when you're going to progressively download that information or upload it to the client as needed. So some examples, two that I like to show. One's called Trello. Trello is a Kanban board that's on the web. It's basically a very simple spa where you can put in things like, here's their sample. They've got a category for intermediate and basics. And you can drag and drop these cards on these different columns. And as you do that, it's making calls back to the back end. It's an implicit save. Make an AJAX call to save that data so it knows where it was put. As you type things in or add new cards, there's no page refresh. It's all run locally. I actually have several Trello boards, and I keep them up all day in my browser. Works great. Very, very fast. Uh, something called Gmail, another spa. You've got your email up and running there. And no, that's not my email. It was very hard to find a fake Gmail image, by the way. So we've got all of our accounts up here for our inbox and all the other folders we have. And all that data, as you're moving around, that's like a spa. When you go to Calendar or Contacts or some other page inside of Gmail, 90% of the data changes and so does the screen. That's when they do a post and say, you know what, get rid of what's there. Let's load a new spa. So that's how you can break up your app into multiple chunks as well. Think of them like silos. Talking to a friend the other day, we were talking about the original Outlook web access back in, I don't know, 10 years ago. I'm sure I've got the years wrong here. But you know, the way Outlook web access worked when they had the regular and the light version, the old ones, that was like one of the first spas if you think about it. Not the light one, but the, the heavy web one. They did all that stuff on the client in the browser to allow you to look at your mail and whatnot. So it's not like spa was something we invented yesterday at, you know, Tuesday morning. This stuff's been around, and there's been plenty of apps that run like this. It's just now becoming much easier for us to write them. So at this point, you're all convinced Spa's awesome. Let's go write some. Well, how do we get started? One of the first things you want to do is open up Visual Studio and check out some of the new templates that are baked in with the MVC4 templates. And there are several that come with Visual Studio with the latest update and the latest tooling. One of them comes out of the box. 
The other ones you can download off of the ASP.NET website at ASP.NET slash singles dash page dash applications. Now I've got some links to these later for you. And once you do that, you've got a few options. First, there's four I'd like to talk about. The ASP.NET one's the one that comes out of the box. That uses Knockout JS, which gives you data binding. And all of these samples run a to-do app. You've got lists of to-dos, and then you've got to-dos inside of those lists. There's no save buttons or cancels. It's all implicitly saving. Just to give you an idea of how it works. They're little demos. There's also an Ember, Angular, and a Breeze one. And all of those are to-do apps, and they just show you how you can use these different frameworks. They're very nice, and they're samples, basically. But what I like to look at are the two other ones that are in there. One's called the Randall, and one's called Hot Towel. Hot Towel is one that I wrote, so you can see why I like that. So in Hot Towel, I wanted to use Knockout, because I like Knockout, and I used a Randall. The Randall is a framework we'll be looking at today that helps you put a lot of the spa things together. And it gives you all the navigation and history, too, and a lot of the other features. But the big difference between the four on the left and the two on the right is the Durandal and Hot Towel templates that come out of Visual Studio, they're not samples, really. They're not really demos. They're going to get you going right out of the gate and say, all right, I know I want to spa. I want to start adding views and view models and all my other stuff in the client. That's where you're going to want to use Hot Towel. If you're trying to sell what a spa do to your boss or to a colleague and they're not really sure what it is, look at the four on the left. Those are going to give you a demo. But I wouldn't start with those for an application because, for example, if you open up the ASP.NET one and you want to start building a customer application for contacts, first thing you're going to do is delete all the to-do code, all the screens for to-dos, all the logic for to-dos, all that kind of stuff. So you're going to delete a bunch of code and then start adding your own in. The idea I had behind Hot Towel is, well, when I create a new app, I don't want to have to delete a bunch of code and then add it. I just want to start going. And we're going to take a look at that. So with the architecture of Hot Towel... Basically, you've got your HTML, and then Hot Towel has three key ingredients, all of which we'll look at here. The Randall is a framework that allows us to put all the pieces together in SPA. It's kind of like your plumbing. It's your one-stop shop to allow you to put all the architecture together. Knockout does the data binding for us, so we can get the data from our JavaScript into our UI and the HTML really easily. And then Breeze is a rich data client. And I'm going to talk a lot about Breeze and what it does for you, because until you write an application, a SPA, without using Breeze, you don't appreciate it. And I'm going to show you an app that I wrote without Breeze, and then the same one that I wrote with it, and I'll show you why it's important. And on the server, you can put whatever you want. I happen to like the Microsoft stack with Web API and Entity Framework and SQL Server. You don't have to use this. In fact, I'm actually in the middle of writing one that runs on Ruby on Rails. The same client stack against any server you want. Makes it powerful. All right, so my tagline for Hot Towel is because you certainly don't want to go to the spa without one. So you don't want to build one without one either. And this is what you get out of the box. When you run Hot Towel, you get this app. It's branded with Twitter Bootstrap. It's a nice, um, gives you nice visuals. Helps you out with some of your CSS. And it gives you two pages by default, home and details. So you got two pages, they're both blank, you can put out whatever you want in there, and then you can put your content in place. And obviously you can theme it how you want, but it gives you a nice template to get started. So let's go ahead and jump over to the demo. I love the pause between going to the demo. Makes you think it's not going. All right, so inside of Visual Studio, what we want to do is do a new project here and go into MVC Web Application. Once I do that, you're going to see a whole series of different top sh options we have, one of which is Hot Towel Spa. I'm going to select that, and hopefully our internet connection is good. It's going to create the application, and it's going to download a bunch of NuGet packages that will help me get all that I need to go. It's going to get Twitter Bootstrap to help me with the styling. It's going to get the Randall to help me put the spa pieces together. It'll get Knockout to do the data binding. It's also going to go out and get Breeze, so I can do my rich data, and a couple other little libraries, too. One I really like called Moment.js, which I'm not going to talk much about here, but if you need date manipulation in JavaScript, you want Moment.js. It does all that for you. Any kind of date conversions, manipulations, calculations, that kind of stuff we get for free in .NET, not so great in JavaScript world. Moment.js really helps you there. So when we come down, we look inside the Packages folder, 
you'll see a bunch of things in here, a whole bunch of ASP.NET, by the way. So you can see that's Microsoft. And then we've got Breeze up top. We mentioned that. We've got Durandal, plus two, pr two different plugins I like with Durandal. One allows me to do paging, go to page page. And the other one, Transitions, allows me to have little animated transitions between the pages. Then I've got my jQuery, so I can make any DOM manipulation if I want to. And then Knockout. And then towards the bottom, we've got this thing called Toaster, which gives us our little alerts. And then the Twitter Bootstrap makes it easy for us to style it. So it basically puts in everything you need to get going. What does it do when I run? So we hit Control F5. Up should pop up the web server. And there's Hot Towel. We've got our code instantly. And we've got our little toast down here. We can go from page to page. And as we go page to page, you'll see progress bars and animations. If you want to see what's going on down below, let's go to the console window. Let me clear that, and let's refresh the page. One of the nice things I like about the Randall is there's an option to show every activity that it has. It'll write to the console window, if you tell it to, everything that's happening when it loaded. So when it loaded up, it said starting it, and then it does an activating event. And when I load this thing called the shell, my shell view is the main view that we're looking at. And then it activated a route. It went to the default route. Routes are basically what page you want to go to. And then it loaded the details view, because that's the one I happen to be on. And then it did a bunch of binding for different areas. I had four views on this page. Four. The shell, the main view. And then inside of the shell, I had three sub views. I have the header for navigation. I have the footer. And then I've got my main content area. So a common question I get a lot is, how do I take a spa and make like a dashboard out of it? Well, you can certainly have as many views as you want inside of other views just by laying them out in CSS. And then Durandal makes it really easy for you to say, well, this view gets put over here. Just go ahead and load it. And if I clear this, and now we go to another page, you'll see the activity down there for that. Now let's look at something else in here. We go to the network timeline. I'm going to clear everything out. We're going to run from scratch again. As I refresh, you can see everything that got downloaded here. Now, normally in a production app, I'm going to use minification and bundling. For here, for a demo, I turned it off so we could actually see what's happening. But you can see all the files coming down. Notice the XHR. These actually were AJAX requests that were made to go get our views. The four views I'm showing by default are the shell, my navigation, and my footer. And then I'm on the home view, so it went and got that home HTML. Now, let me clear this. Now, watch how it happens when I press details. It did not get that view yet. On the first call to details, it's going to go out and get that view. Let me clear it one more time. Now, everything's loaded, right? Because I've only got two screens in this app, really. I go back from home to details. No more network activity. It's got that view. So we're good to go. And that's the point there where on the first load, I got everything I needed for that first page. And then after it, I progressively download what I need. There we go. So we've seen, seen what a spa can do and how to get started with the template. The main things you should remember is that when you're going into these templates, the, the templates are really good reference points. They're good samples and demos. And then the hot towel one is a nice one to start where you don't have a demo. I mean, there's nothing really to show. There's no data flowing. But you put your own screens in there and pop them in so you can get your data moving on it. So once you do that, here's a couple of links that I have for you. Uh, if you go to johnpapa.net slash spa, I've got a whole series of links to resources and other things, and I'll show this at the end too, that'll help you get started with these hot towel type templates and understanding more about it, plus about 20 blog posts I've written on the topic. Uh, we've also got a link directly to the spa template so you can download those. If you want the Durandal or the Angular or the hot towel template, for Visual Studio, you need to go download it from that link at Spa Templates. And then finally, if you want to learn more about Hot Towel itself, you can go to that link to learn about Hot Towel. So let's say you wanted to change that template a little bit. Ooh, he's getting dangerous. So we're inside of our MVC app. Everything inside of the Randall is going to be over in this app folder, right over here. Durandal puts the client side app, think of that like your client project, inside of this app folder. And the code I wrote is under views and view models. 
There you can see a view for everything I talked about. And then the view model is the code for that HTML. Clear separation between presentation and my logic. Let's take a look at the shell view. And let's get out of the uh, super zoom. In my shell view, notice I've got a header, a section, and a footer. Three different areas. And we'll learn what these composed things mean in a moment. Inside of each of those, we've got views. There's my detail view. It's just a series of HTML. I'm doing a data binding for the title. Well, let's say inside the details view model, I want to see what's in there. Notice the title set the details view. That is what is showing up when I go to, ah, I killed the project. Let's go ahead and run it. That's what's showing up right here. Home view, details view. So if I change this, that'll change. We could say foo view. And if you cache it, here's a tip for you. Always open up the developer tools here and turn off the caching. I want to disable the cache. Then refresh. And then when you go to details, hey. Did I turn it off? That's OK. You get my point. So after we go here, let's say we want to add another property. I can do now, I can say, all right, create an observable in here. Observable is going to be something we're going to bind to. And that name is going to be a local property. I could put, like, maybe John in there or something. By default, we'll do nothing. And then I want to expose name to my view. So this VM object is what's going to be exposed. Think of that like your public properties inside your JavaScript module. Everything here is going to be returned. So this module returns an activate, a title, and a name. And then if I went over to the details JS, I could come over here. Instead of typing this, I'm actually going to flip over to a completed solution. Look at that. And inside my home, I added this little input. Data bind value with name. All right, well, let's see what happens here. Let's kill the other one. Now we've got home view with enter a name, please. Let me kill those guys. Let's get rid of magnifier. All right, what name do you want me to put in here? Sally. Great. And when I change that, notice it actually alerted to the back end that my name changed. The back end meaning the JavaScript code, not the server. So as I change the values from here to there, and I tab out of the fields, I'm getting messages saying, hey, something changed here. How did that happen? I simply added a data bind element here in this attribute to say, bind for my value of this input, bind it to this thing called name. Name is right there, which cross-references to this observable. And then I did a little trick with knockout. I said, go ahead on name and subscribe to any changes. And when that happens, when any changes happen, I'm going to run this function that calls toaster. That's the library I wrote to pop up those little toasts. And just tell me what, what did it change to. So you can see we can make little changes like that and start building out our spawn and add it up as we need to do. All right, slip back over the deck. So once you start getting in the mindset of building that spa, where do you go? There's three keys. Knockout for data binding. You want data binding in your app. Believe me, you do. You don't want to be writing a lot of code to push and pull data into your application. And you're going to want to make sure that you get some kind of framework in place. We're going to look at the Randall for that. And then we're going to take a look at Breeze for our rich data. So why do we do data bindings in HTML? Because what we want is to avoid a real-life screen that doesn't have one field that says name. Real apps have, you know, 40 fields, 100 fields. Let's say you've got 100 elements on a screen. First of all, it's a very busy screen. But once you get the 100 elements, you had to go get that data somewhere. So let's walk through this. You go out to Ajax, you get 100 elements back from your object, maybe an object graph. When you get those 100 elements back, what do you do next? You go through each one of those and say, all right, this field has to get mapped to this HTML element. Move to the next one. Field two goes to element two. And you write 100 lines of code to say, take all these fields and stick them in all these places on the screen. Great, works. It's not hard, a lot of copy and paste. Hopefully you didn't mistype anything. Then when the user presses saved and you want to validate it, what do you do? 
You have to say, okay, go back to that field on the screen and let's map it into some object in JavaScript and do that for 100 lines of code. So now I've written 200 lines of code that just seems like grunt work. Data binding, all you do is you tell it inside the HTML, this HTML element should be bound to this thing called name, city, state, whatever. No code required to hook that up. And then when the data appears back in the JavaScript, it automatically gets notified, just like the toast got notified. It sends off a hey, I'm here message, and then it says, hey, put me on the screen, and it does. And as soon as the data changes on the screen, it goes back into the JavaScript object, keeping them in sync, two-way data binding. jQuery is great, but it's not fun to write 400 lines of jQuery to do stuff like that. So in Knockout, we get three main things. And I'm just going to go relatively quickly through Knockout, because I've got a whole session on Knockout tomorrow, I think at 10.15, if anyone's interested. But there's three main players in it. Observables. This is what allows you to create a property. An observable property allows you to notify when the JavaScript changes, the value gets updated in the UI. When the value in the UI changes, it gets updated back in the JavaScript. A computed. A computed is a calculated property. Sometimes you have data that comes right out of a database, comes up to your screen through AJAX, and that's what you needed, first name and last name. Other times you want to display something that doesn't come out of your business objects, like full name. Well, the full name is something you'll calculate by adding first name to last name. You can do that on the client with a computed, and that also notifies the UI when changes are made. And then, of course, we need to have arrays and collections of items. You add a whole list of items, list of products, that we searched for into your observable array, whenever you add or remove one from it, it'll be added or removed from the data grid on your screen, and vice versa. Taking a quick look at each of these, here's how you define an observable. We did this with the name property. You create a property, you tell it it's a, you know, a ko.observable for knockout, and right here we've got the title being displayed in this snapshot. Right there is our title, and then the code for that in the HTML down there is going to show us that the data bind is what hooks it up. The key in the data bind is the left and the right sides. The left says, what part of this input am I setting? I'm setting the value of the input. And what am I setting it to? A property called title. Notice the property title matches the name of the variable title. And that's how the data gets there. And then you get that two-way data binding. How do arrays work? Arrays don't track the properties. They track which objects are in the arrays. So whenever you add or remove items, that's when the array is going to notify the UI to let them know something's been added or removed. And you can use functions on these too, which is nice. So when you declare an observable array, any array functions in JavaScript, you can use those on the observable arrays too. So if we hook up our code here, let's say it's our view model, and we've got some data here for speakers. I'm going to go get a list of speakers at an event like TechEd. And when I get those speakers from this thing called data service, get my speakers, then I need to hook it up to my UI. So I've got this thing called a KO observable array, and I want it to render something in my page with like the image and their first name and last name. All that data is going to show up in this list. So in the view, my HTML, I've got some kind of HTML here, and I say for each speaker rendering the same HTML, Go ahead and render it out. Notice the name speakers here matches again to the name of the observable array. And there's a binding. This time we use the binding for each. Last time we used value. But in this case, we want to actually loop through. And the way you iterate through things in an array is a for each. And then we'll render out the image of the first name and last name, which is what we're seeing inside of that article. And the third kind of observable is a computed observable. Computeds allow you to take and derive, make your own derived property. They also support data binding, so you're going to get the same binding that you would with, if you use a regular observable, but you get to rate any, any kind of property that you want, which is cool, and I use these a lot in applications. And the way you define them, for example, let's say I wanted to create one called has changes. So I've got this little star in the bottom right-hand corner. I've changed the title of this session. I want to know when that has changed. So when it's changed, I want to put the star and make it visible. And if there's changes, I want to highlight, sorry, to enable the save button. You shouldn't be able to press the save unless someone's actually made a change. It's a nice user experience. 
So what I do is I create a computed, I called it has changes, and then inside of that computed I give it a function and I return back the value of some other property that knows if there were changes or not. So that one there is going to point over to that little star, that star is bound to it, and the can save. How do I know if I can save? Well, I only want the user to save if there's changes and they're not in the middle of a save. Because when they press save, I don't want the user going save like this on the button, and you know you've done it before. You know? I want to be one of those guys that says, you can do it all you want, but I'm going to disable the button after you press it once until I'm done, so I don't get 42 AJAX requests going back. So what I do is say, if there were changes and you're not already in the middle of the save, go ahead and let this computed return back true. And then that's going to bind up to the uh, enabling or disabling of the save button. So I think the key here is to show how bindings can be used in the real world. We've seen some little samples here. But let's go look at it in an app, because bindings are really, really important. We've got a bunch of bindings that are built in a knockout, and the way that they're going to look for you is they're going to allow you to do things like setting the value, or we did the for each, but you can also do enable. You see that here. Or you can do things like options, like drop-down lists. How do you load a list of colors into a drop-down? And then select the value. And what if that's a list of objects? Then you want the options text to be set to the name, but I also want, when that was selected, to actually store the value of the key of that color. So we can have drop-downs, complex objects, be loaded into those, and use that with data bindings, too. So let's look at that same sample here. We've got hot towel. And in here, we had a couple bindings hooked up. But let's kill that, and let's go over to a little more built sample. And I'll give you the link to this a little bit later, too. If you go to that johnpapa.net slash spa page, you're going to find a link to this GitHub project. If you pull this GitHub project down, this is what you're going to get. This is also a live demo to this, as you can check on the web. And when you go up into here, we can see we can select a session at an event. This is all running live. I can go look at all the speakers. That's that speakers page we looked at. And if I right-click on here to inspect element, we should see a for each somewhere in here. Let's go back up. Actually, should be able to see the page. There we go. We'll click on Aaron's head. And inside of here, we can see a section and a for each right there. It's looping through all my speakers. And then for every speaker, we've got an article. Notice we've got a series of articles. There's one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. All those are getting rendered into the HTML using Knockout. So how does that work? Well, this is on the speaker's view, so we went back to the code, which I think I've loaded. Yes, I have. We have a speaker's view here. There's our HTML for it. Not a whole lot of HTML. It's 20 lines. And up top, there's our header. And then we've got this for each for speakers. And then I just repeat, for every speaker, I've got my image name, first name, and last name. And that's it. And if I go look at the view model for speakers, which is aptly named speakers, I've got 20 lines of JavaScript. Hey, that's cool. I didn't realize I had the same number of lines. So there we've got our speakers observable array. And when this thing activates, that's a function I call when the page loads up. I say, go to this thing called data context. That gets me my data. Get this thing called speaker partials. It's partial because I'm not getting everything about a speaker. I'm just getting their names and their picture. That's all I want. And then load it into the speakers. That's the observable right there. And then on refresh, I've got an override to say, you know what, don't cache the data, go back to the database and get it again, in case something's changed. So that's all I needed. I just needed this observable array, the call to get the data, and then expose it. And then in my HTML, I just had a for each right through the speakers. And that brings me, what is, that's still running? That's funny. And that gets me back to my speakers page. So we can go back and forth through these guys all day. And one of the neat things is, as I get my data, if I look at network again, go down to XHR. I'm going to make it slightly smaller so I can see more. Let's go ahead and refresh from scratch. We should only be looking at any XHR request in the bottom. Now those are going to include a couple things. First, lookups. What's that? That's all my lookup values. Like, what rooms does TechEd have? What tracks? What session states? All that kind of lookup list things. Things that aren't going to change a whole lot. I bundled those together and brought them back as JSON data. 
And that's what you're seeing over here, the San Quentin room, uh, ID number 20, etc. And then I went out and got a list of the speakers, just their names. Why? Because that's data that I'm going to need pretty much on every page. Whether I'm looking at a session or session details or speakers or my favorites, pretty much anything I do or my agenda, I'm going to need the speaker's name and the session. The session title and the speaker name. So for that, I'm going out and getting that data. I'm also getting the basic information about sessions because I'm on a sessions page when I load it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to display them. Then I got two views, sessions and nav. The nav bar is up here. That's a view. And then the sessions down here. Now, if we clear that off and I go to speakers, we should expect to see the speaker's HTML view and then any additional data that we don't already have. In this case, we just got the speaker's HTML view. Why? Why didn't we need more data? We already had it. I already knew the names of the speakers and their pictures. Well, now watch. We go back to sessions. I clear this out. Go back to sessions. No new calls. Go back to speakers. No new calls. I'm flipping around. Now, let's say I go into a session. Oh, this looks cool. Build a single page app. You guys might be interested in that. We click on this. And now I'm getting more session data. The reason I'm getting more session data is because before all I had was their name and the picture. Well, you want to see the title, the description, the track, the level, all that fun stuff. The rating of the session, which, by the way, should be high. <laughs> you will laugh. So after you get that session data, that full one, now we can load in all that data. We also got the session detail view. Now, this is cool. I really love this. I hit the back button here or there on the browser. I go back to sessions. Notice no new data calls. I go back into John Papa. No data calls. Go back again. Now let's go down to Pete Brown. Great guy, by the way. Click on that. New data. I'm remembering the full session information for each session as I get it and caching it on the client. But I don't get everything unless I need it. If I got all the sessions and all their data, that's a ton of information that nobody's going to go to TechEd and look at every single session, right? You just physically can't. But you might go look at 10 or 20 of them, so get them as you need. Yes? You're asking who's doing the caching of the data? The caching of the data is actually being handled by Breeze, which we'll be looking at very shortly. Uh, you can write that by yourself, and I will show you how. And you will be very glad that I showed you Breeze. <laughs> I like to do things the hard way sometimes. Okay, so we finished the knockout section of this. That's one of the key pieces. Let's look at the Randall. The Randall is a framework. I like to think of things in the Silverlight world, the WPF world, the ASP.NET world, the JavaScript world as two flavors of tools I can use. There's frameworks, and then there's libraries. And it's just semantics for me, but I think of a framework as you pick one in your application. You don't go pick four frameworks and combine them together. A framework is there to be the plumbing for how does your app going to work. Do all the dirty work for me. So what kind of dirty work would you have in a spa? Loading views. Might seem like a pain in the butt to figure out which view am I loading, where is it located on the server, do I have it already cached, and then which view model should it be paired with? And then how do I know to run the view model first or the view first? All that kind of stuff. How do I activate the paging and the routing? All the stuff you do when you start up an app. The Randall can do that for you. It's a framework. It'll do that kind of stuff for you. It's not, it's not the sexy stuff like Knockout or Breeze. It's all the hard work that goes into every app. Other frameworks that are really popular are uh, AngularJS, Ember. That's another one as well. I happen to really like both the Randall and Angular. They're both very powerful and let you do pretty much 90% of what you need to do with a SPA. So once you pick a framework, what are those key things you want to do? You want to do that composition. It's a term I like to use because you're helping compose your modules. Think of everything in JavaScript as a module, kind of like a class. You want to take your views, those are modules, your view models, those are modules, and put them together and build something. The Randall's going to help you do that. It's going to give you routing, paging. You want to be able to have multiple uh, views in your app, right? Not many of us build one-screen apps. Spa. 
we're going to build multiple page apps. It's going to give you app lifecycle. You're probably going to want to know when your screen appears and when it goes away. And in some cases, you may want to interrogate the screen and say, before you go away, check these conditions. The Randall will give you all that and more. Navigation. You want to navigate through different pages as well. You want to integrate with the history. Data binding. It's built on top of Knockout. So you get Knockout with the Randall. Instead of reinventing data binding, the Randall just used Knockout. And in fact, that's how it does its page composition. So we've got this screen we've looked at. And when you transition between multiple views, the Randall's doing the work for you. It allows you to go from speakers to sessions. It lets you to hook into navigation so you can tell it which view to go to directly or type it in the address bar for deep linking. You can also hook into the browser history for backing up and going forward. And the whole thing about reducing your round trips, there's a couple different options in Durandal which allow you to preload everything or just go get things as you need it. Once you go live with the Durandal project, it, Durandal comes with this thing called an optimizer. And the optimizer will basically take all your views and all your code for the app, let you put it into a single downloadable file that Durandal will look at and grab. So if you want to load your entire spa up front, and you don't want to go get 100 views, 100 Ajax calls, which would probably be bad if you got them all up front like that. Instead, the optimizer that Durandal has will let you bundle that all into one file automatically and pull it down, basically minifies it for you too. So it's one Ajax call. You don't want to do that during debugging because it gets really hard to debug that. But once you go live, that's a great option. So you can really avoid a lot of page refreshes with Durandal too. So we talked about some of these features. You can load your, your modules as needed. We saw that in action. You get this app lifecycle. We'll take a closer look at that. You also get async programming with promises. If you're doing client-side development, Flash, Silverlight, JavaScript, you're doing async. You're doing Windows 8 development. You're doing a lot of async there, too. Async is kind of difficult at times because you make a call, and then you need to know when's that call done. In traditional techniques, use callbacks, which are fine, but promises are more elegant. And the Randall bakes that whole philosophy of promises into it. And we'll see some examples of that. And the way that we use promises in the Randalls, we're always going to return a value from all the functions to let it know when the function is done. For example, that's how the Randall knows when you've activated your form. You write an activate method, and I return back a value of true to say, I'm done activating. That way, Durandall can do whatever else it needs to do after you've activated your screen. And there's conventions in it. Notice how my view model and view are both named speakers. They just, because I named them the same, they both get married together. Isn't that great? You know how life should be. If you got the same name as a woman, you got to just you get married. There you go. You know? I'm not going there. So in Durandal, you keep things with the same name. It says, hey, I know you. Let's put you two together. It's a matchmaker. You can change the conventions. That's fine. There's ways to get around it. But out of the box, most of the time, you're going to want to do that. There's times I don't. For example, my nav view, for my navigation stuff and the examples I've been showing, there is no view model called nav. But there's a view called nav. It does have a view model. And I'll show you where that is. So you can break convention if you need to. And you get page navigation. Quite frankly, a lot of SPA frameworks don't give you this out of the box. And I can't understand why. If you build an app, every app I have ever built that wasn't a demo I did on stage had paging. It had more than one screen. I don't build anything for companies that doesn't have more than one screen. So I'm going to need pa paging and navigation into it. The good news is Durandal and, and Angular, as I mentioned, both those have paging and navigation built in which is great. So let's say you're configuring a menu. There's a shortcut for all this code, but I wanted to show them details of it to give you an idea of what you can do with Durandal. So we got this thing called a router that comes with Durandal. The way you tell Durandal, what do you want to use? What module do you want? Out of the box, it has this thing called a router. The router is its paging tool. So I go get the router using the syntax of require. Require, you can think of it like asynchronous module loading. It says, I'm not going to load all the modules that you need until you need them. Almost like dependency injection. Go get me the router. After I get the router, 
I'm then going to set up all my routes and I'll pass it to this router. My routes are different pages. I've got a view model sessions page and a view model speakers page. I've defined the name that I want to show inside of the HTML. I define the URL that people go to. When you, so when you go to slash speakers, it's going to load the speakers. I've defined the view model that I want you to load. I have not told it which view to load because by convention it's going to load the speakers.html. And I've set visible to true. By default, the Randall lets you set visible to true or false, and all the ones set to visible will actually get returned in an array of visible routes. Those are like top level menu items that you can bind to a screen. So normally in an app, I'll create this routes array of objects. I could load that off a database, have a database store on my menus, bring up the ones I need that the user has authentication for, let the server figure that out, it returns to the client all the routes that I need, and then I can data bind that using knockout to the screen. Once I've got those routes back, what I'll do is I'll pass it into my router.map function. So I've got the router, I say map these routes. And I map them in and it takes in that array of objects and then I can bind to it and put it on the screen. And then notice I'm also doing two other things in the activate and they're both very important. The first is I'm router activating the sessions. That means if they don't ask for a specific route, go to sessions. That's going to be the default startup view. The second is I'm doing return router.activate. A lot of people get in trouble when they use the Randall because they forget the return. The reason the return is there is because activate returns a promise. Your activate method gets called by the Randall when the screen loads up, and then it waits. There's certain things it's going to wait for after activate. You need to tell it when you're done. So you return back a value <clears throat> at the end of activate. So inside of my screen, I've got this section, and I've got this compose data binding. The compose is a custom binding that comes with Durandal, very similar to the knockout syntax because that's what it's using. It says, please compose the model called speakers. And the second parameter I'm passing is activate to true. I want it to automatically deactivate it in this case. It's a demo. So I compose up here the model, my speakers model. And that's going to load up the speakers HTML and the speakers JS. You just use a compose binding. That's why that shell code that I showed you was so small. Inside that shell code, let's go look, we had very little HTML. Inside of my shell, I've got a header and I've got a section. And then inside of there, I've got these compose bindings, which I'm using a different syntax there. Let me go ahead and type in the same one we just had. So I use data bind. It's trying to be smarter than me. We don't need that. We don't need that. And we've got crazy quotes going on. There we go. So I'm saying in the header, go compose the view called nav. In this case, I'm not saying model. There is no view model for it. I'm going to tell you, go compose the view called nav. That's nav.html. It's going to go get and go, OK, where's your view model? I don't know. He didn't tell me. You don't have anything called nav.js. And what it's going to do is say, all right, if you don't tell me the view model and I can't find it, I'm going to bind to, unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to bind to whatever other view models on this page. I'm in the shell HTML, and guess what? There's a shell JS. So the shell HTML is bound to shell JS, and when it loads itself, this sub view called nav.html will also be bound to shell JS. So that's a way you can share view models for multiple views. That's one way. And then down here, let's go ahead and put in our other syntax. So we've got our data bind. I think my quotes are off again somewhere. Oh, wrong one. So now I've got this compose here. It's saying the model I want you to bind to, I could have typed in speakers or sessions, but I want this to be dynamic. I want it to be whatever the route that they selected was. In other words, the user types into the address bar, go to this page, speakers, sessions, session details, whatever the active routing 
item is. That's what I want you to bind and load, that view and that view model. And after you're done composing, I want you to call this method after compose. That's going to allow me to turn on and off my progress indicator. So I can visually tell the user when they're done. And then finally, I put this thing in called transition. Transition is going to put a little animation in so it floats in. So when I run this, notice when I go from page to page, you're seeing a slight animation from, for me, right to left. Well, if I turn off this transition and get rid of the comma, oh, that's actually a live site, so now we have to run this one. So we run this guy up. I just removed the transition. It should just appear on the page. Shouldn't be anything. There we go. Notice they're just kind of popping in and out. It's fine. It's just an animation. I can stick it back in if I want to. Control Z. Zoop. Too many Control Zs. There we go. Pop it back over. Open the developer tools. Go to the cache. We should get an animation back. There we go. So Durandal allows you to put these little things in there. The key here is the compose. What do you want to compose? The model? That's the view model. Again, I can hard code that, which you probably wouldn't want to do, or I can data bind it. So let's go into a little more complicated one. We've got session details. And in session details, we've got a header at the top, which I'll hide. And then we've got all of our session information. What does this look like on screen? Looks like this. I've got all my inputs and my drop downs. Inside of there, I've got my title. You see my inputs? I'm just using data binding with Knockout. All the HTML is just regular old Knockout. All this stuff in here inside the data bind is telling it what do I bind to. And then when I go load the session details, let's close everything else. By the way, my favorite keystroke, what is it there? Control MO, Control ML in Visual Studio. It basically collapses all the internal methods, makes it a little easier to see. You can see I've got the session, the rooms, the tracks, the time slots. All those map up right here. And then I've got my little methods like, hey, can I save? That looks familiar. That's getting bound. So when I change this and I tab out, I got my little star right there. And then the state in my buttons changed. And when I cancel, they all go back. That's because they're looking at has changes and are you in the middle of save? So I've got all those little methods in there, and I've also got this cool one called can deactivate, which we'll talk about next. So Durandal gives us a lot of the plumbing to help build the app. Those are the things you don't want to have to worry about. How do you get screens to appear? How do you transition? And I talked about this activate method. Durandal has a concept of an activator. There's really, I like to think of there's two ways to get something to appear. Your code can do it, or a user can do it. If your code is doing it, it's easy to tell the code, while you're doing this, go ahead and show this view. If the user does it, something inside of Durandal has to tell your view model to load, so that compose binding works. That's an activator. So it's the concept of an activator. What uses an activator? The router does it. So if somebody uses the router, it's going to automatically call the activator to load your views and view models. A modal dialog, which is a feature built into Durandal, will automatically call the activator. The third thing is you can set activate to true, which is what I did in the demo earlier. That's like a manual way of doing it. Why would you care if it was created to an activator? Because when you use an activator, you get the activate method, the can deactivate, the can activate, and the deactivate. Four methods. Basically lifecycle methods that will fire in your view model so you can capture logic when your application is loading or shutting down. So what does that lifecycle look like? Inside of Durandal 1.2, which is the current version, when you've got an activator present, anything asterisk will only appear if you have an activator. First, when you load something up, we're going to see, can I activate? Let's say I'm on a screen, screen A. It's going to first check to see, can I activate screen B? Before I go there, can I activate it? And then I can cancel or continue by returning true or false. And then, can I activate, deactivate my old module? So I've just said and can activate, can I load up screen B? Yes. Now, can I get rid of screen A? Because maybe you're in the middle of a change editing and you want to stop the user and say, hey, wait a minute, you want to get off the screen until you're done canceling or saving. If that is returned true, then it will activate 
actually I should say the deactivate. It'll uh, deactivate the old module and then it will activate the new one. After that, there's a couple others. There's one called before bind. If you want to do something before knockout, it does its data binding. And then after it, there's other events you can use. And finally, view attached. View attached is really critical if you're doing things with jQuery and you need to do some kind of a jQuery selector to find an element in your DOM. The DOM is not actually constructed and attached to the screen until after this view attached event. Think of it like an on doc ready. If you're in a lot of jQuery, you want to wait to make sure your DOM is actually in the browser. View attached is where you put that logic. So Durandal opens all that up for you. The reason I'm mentioning Durandal 1.2 is because in two months Durandal 2.0 will be out and there are a couple little changes. The first change, if I can get the button to work, there we go, you're also going to get a document attached event. And activate no longer requires an activator. Activate will always fire no matter who activates the screen, which is kind of nice actually. So you're always going to get that activate event. So where do we use activate? If you go back to our view model in session detail, when the session detail loads, there's an activate method. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to parse out the route data to find out which session should I get. Then I'm going to initialize all my lookups. That's going to load those drop down lists for me. And finally, I'm going to go get the session by ID. And when it comes back, I'm going to stick it in the session object. Seems like a pretty easy thing for Activate to do. What about when I leave a page? So when I leave a page, I want to check to see, can I deactivate? So what would happen to cause to do that? Let's say I start typing in a title, and now I hit the back button on the browser. Do you want to get out of here or not? I can actually interrogate and ask the user, do you want to leave? What's happening in there is it's saying, in can deactivate, if I'm in the middle of a delete, I wasn't in the middle of a delete, so I passed that. Then, if I have changes, I did have changes, so I'm going to hit this logic. I put together a title and a message, and then I show a message box. That's a feature in the Randall. So I show the message and say, hey, do you want to get out of here or not? And they use a promise. When they're done selecting yes or no, the logic in the then is going to run. That's this check answer. Check answer is a function right there. We'll scroll up a little. So after I select the button right here, let's select no. I don't want to leave. It's going to capture the selected option. And I'm going to run a if logic, say if they said yes, call this cancel logic. And then I'm going to return the selected option. So the returning the selected option, yes or no, it's either going to leave the page or it's going to stop the navigation. Very important. Most apps that I write with users, when they make changes, they don't want the page to be able to be turned to another page unless they get to save or cancel. However, if you're writing an app where you want to have multiple pages open and save all the changes at once, multiple pages, you might not want to do that logic. The cool thing here is you have choices. You can put that logic in or you cannot. So now if we want to go back, it'll capture this button I call to go back. And I can say, yeah, cancel my changes. That could be no, or do you want to cancel and get out? I can do yes. And if I go back into that session, you notice the title's back to normal. If I change changes here on the keynote and I hit save, and then I hit the back button, it knew that the changes had already been saved, so it let me go back. And now Scott's got this really funky title. There we go. So Durant will give you quite a bit in this life cycle. What happens when you start getting into real line of business type apps? That's where Breeze comes in. So Breeze gives you rich data, really robust data on your client. You've got 10 screens in your app. Let's say they're all sharing the session title for the sessions at TechEd. You get session details, you get session lists, you got an agenda. You want to share that data. What if somebody changes that title? Like when I change the keynote title for Scott. If I do that, I expect all the other screens to have that same name. Rich, uh, rich data will help us do that, and Breeze will help us get there. So why do you care? Because you know what? We don't just get and display data in our apps. We do a whole lot more. We like transactions. We like canceling. We like change tracking. Most of our objects that we get to aren't just get first name and last name. They're usually some object hierarchy, some object graph. 
You might be getting like customer and their orders and their order details and their products and their salesperson. If you get that kind of data, you want it to get it properly and manage that navigation through that object. All right, so those are our rich data features we want. These are just some that Breeze gives us. Client caching and sharing. It'll cache the data. The question was asked earlier, how's that data cached in the client? Breeze is doing it for us. Basically creates like a client-side repository that we can use to cache our data. And we can share the data across multiple views and view models. Awesome, if we want to. There's an option in Breeze, too, where you could say, you know what? I want the data in this section of the application to not be shared with that one. You can create multiple on the client. You can create queries. I think you'll love the way you can write queries with Breeze. It makes writing AJAX so nice. You can extend your models. Let's say the models you get back from AJAX aren't exactly what you want. You want to add your own properties and things to them? You can extend them. You can manage object graphs, object hierarchies. Works great with Knockout. It also works with Angular and other tools, too. And it also works with async and promises, just like Durandal. Well, let's look at this code. Let's say you wanted to get a list of speakers and just their first and last names, kind of like the speaker list we had. You could write a query with Breeze. Just create a variable called query, and Breeze exposes this object called entity query. Go get the entity's speakers. Only get the speakers, and then get, order them by last name, then first name. Kind of looks like link. All right, so we create a query. Then you execute that query. I say, go to the manager object. That's the Breeze main object. It manages everything for you. And you say, manager, execute the query, called query. And when you're done, call query succeeded. If for some reason you failed, call query failed. So then when we get that query back, because it's asynchronous, we call query succeeded. It returns to us the data. And inside of data.results, it's going to have an array of all the speakers. And I just shove them in my array. Pretty easy, huh? So Breeze makes it easy to get this stuff. And you can write much more complex queries. Think of it like Link for JavaScript in a lot of ways. It does so much more, but it allows us to make it much easier to just go get our data. Notice we're not calling out the HTTP requests. We're not specifying if it's JSON or XML. We're not having to go in here and tell all the different parameters that you have to tell when you make AJAX requests. It handles it under the covers for you. You can pre-configure it. You can send headers and stuff if you want to. But when you just want to go get your data, you tell it what data do you want, how do I want to order it. You can do where clauses. You can filter them, all sorts of stuff. You can do object graphs. Like here we've got a session. In that session, we've got a speaker. I want to go back and get a list of sessions. I need to have that speaker to get the image. I need the time slot. I need to know the room and the track. That's some kind of complex structure. We can get that data, and what Breeze will do is it'll say, you want the session, and you want those fields, those properties and objects, I'll go get them for you, and I'll manage the relationship. And the cool part is, if I go out and get all the sessions and all these sub-objects, when it sees the same room, this room here, for another session, it doesn't get it again. It just says, you know what, point to the same one, I've already got it. So it actually points to the same things for you, manages that relationship. Let's say you've got four screens sharing data. Here we've got this speaker here, my wife, who loves when I put her picture up on screen. So we've got her picture on the left and the right. I don't want to have to have that data in two places. Breeze will let us share the same speaker information. It'll cache it. So this is a picture of the owner and creator of Breeze. You're welcome, Ward Bell. So with Breeze, it makes it a lot easier to do those kind of things. And I'll show you some code in that I think will really impress you as to why I should probably be committed into an insane asylum. So if I go into this code camper code, this is the old code I had run. Let me open up Visual Studio. Let me show you the new code first while that loads. Here is the code that I wrote in the new object that you just looked at, this new application. There is a property here, a file here called data context. Let's go look at that. Data context is where I hide all my Breeze code. Data context has a job in life. It's to go get my data and to save my data. None of my view models do that. I let the data context handle all the data interaction. And then any time I extend a model, I put it in a model. So there's two files here. Let's go back and look at data context. Let's go ahead and 
Control M O and Control M L. We can see the code in here. I've got methods like go get the speaker partials, go get the sessions, get the session by ID, cancel the changes. Look how simple that code is. Cancel changes. Manager, reject changes, please. If I want to go get the list of speakers, I've got a forcer mode up front. After that, I just write a query. Go get my speakers. Don't get everything. Just get the ID, first name, and last name, and the image. That's the stuff I loaded up front. Order it. When you're done, go ahead and show that data. When I go get a session by ID, that's when I get the full session. I go out and I get the session by key. I've already got the session ID because it was on the other screen. It was session number four. I passed it into here. Bree says, hey, do I already have that? If I do, go ahead and use it. If I don't, fetch it from the remote data store. And then when I'm done, I write this query, say, go ahead and any queries, get the entity for session, execute it, and when I'm done, bring back the data results. So in this file, this is the part I wanted to show, there's 240 lines of code. Most of it is just, you know, going into getting the data, saving the data for this app. 240 lines of code. Let's go look at another application I wrote. And here it is live on the web, and I'll give you a link to this too. It's a blue version of Code Camper. So it's the same kind of app, same kind of functionality. I wrote this without Breeze, and when I show you the code for the data context, I think you'll be quite impressed. So the data context is here, 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 um, here, 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 uh, down there, here, and there's another one I'm missing. But I think you get the point, right? 2,000 lines of code. Let's take a look at it. Is it hard code? You tell me. Let's go full screen. Does that look like query syntax to you? No. How do you add data? Well, I wrote a bunch of logic to figure it out. How do I get data? Let's go. How do I get my sessions? Let's say get sessions and attendance. I'm going and calling some data here and writing a lot of when logic and if logic. A lot of nested asynchronous calls to figure out how I get my data. And quite frankly, this code, even though it's 2,000 lines of code and it does the same thing the other app does, and it's a lot more complicated to maintain, it doesn't do as much. Every time that I want to add a method, I have to add a new function in here to do it for insert, update, delete, get one by ID, or get multiple. Think of it like if you didn't have um, Entity Framework on the back end to go get some of your data for you. How would you write your code? We used to use things like the Enterprise Library to go out and write our own methods to do that. Well, Breeze kind of eliminates a ton of that. So the moral of the story, listen to the dog. Breeze works for you. Uh, some more links you can use. If you go to these two, that's really the, the keys what you'll need. The first one is directly to a course. I've got a six-hour course on this topic, which goes a lot deeper into it, which is the first link up at Pluralsight. The second link is on my website. What I've done is I've gathered about 40 or 50 different links about SPA, and I put it up on a single page up there. Get it? Single page. Put it up on my uh, website at johnpapa.net slash SPA, and from there you can find all the links to everything I've talked about today, uh, even the link to the source code for the application as well. So if you flip back to him, what you'll see there, this is the web page for johnpapa.net SPA. You'll see a whole bunch of blog posts on how to do this. You'll see the code. There's a live demo right there. This is that Code Camper Jumpstart. You can run it live on the internet. And you, yeah, John Papa rules. Thanks. Somebody changed that live. Thank you. At least it wasn't something bad to show. <laughs> Download the source code. Everybody says, where's the source code? So it's right here. It's open source. You can pull it, do whatever you want with it. Uh, have a blast. The database and everything. Uh, and with that, we've got five minutes left. Oh, wow, perfect timing. We've got a couple minutes for questions. Everybody has it. Uh, before I ask you that, I please ask you to please rate the sessions and please come to my knockout session tomorrow if you have time. Any questions? Thank you. So go ahead and use the microphones for questions, I guess, so I can hear you. Okay, my question is, how do you avoid someone opening the JavaScript console 
and monkeying around with your app. How do you avoid what in the console? Like, let's say you're in Chrome. I'm way up here on the, your left-hand side. On the left-hand side. OK, cool. How do you open, let's say someone goes to your website, opens up Chrome, opens up the JavaScript console. Are there things in place for them to not start monkeying around with your app since it's mostly JavaScript? Oh, so you want to not show all the console messages in there? Is that what you're saying? No, but with the JavaScript console that's built into Chrome, you can assign variables, you can do all sorts of things. Yeah. So how do you avoid in an SPA oh, avoiding it. Gotcha. someone basically hacking your website by just opening up the JavaScript console? Well, the key, it, you can't avoid it entirely. Um, there, oh, there are ways, but you, you really can't avoid it entirely. But usually what I do is I just make sure that anything that I have and give them access to, I still vet it with validation. So there's validation in this app that I didn't show, but I make sure that anything that's important enough that I don't want somebody to change, I actually do validate it and make sure somebody didn't do anything wrong. OK. Yeah. Yeah, you basically have to validate cool. server side. Stack? With the stack you're using, uh, how testable is it uh, with, say, Jasmine or uh, QUnit? And the JavaScript testable. Customer. So you can absolutely unit test it all. In fact, this Code Camper Jumpstart, the white one, I didn't write unit tests for it because I ran out of time. But the blue one, uh, which I'm going to make available later this week on GitHub, that one's got unit tests written in QUnit for it as well. OK, sounds great. Uh, hello? So, um, what sort of. Um approach would you recommend uh, for like responsive sites because uh, I'm assuming there's a bunch of like uh, libraries that you need to load up uh, so you know it's gonna it's probably gonna bog down the the site on load or something like that are you saying when you get like a large application how yeah, do you speed yeah. it up mm -hmm. well there's two approaches I take one is I try to make sure that I only load the needed pieces up front like I mentioned Randall will optimize everything for you and load a thousand screens at once if, if it wants to and if you wanted to but in that case, I probably wouldn't. The other approach that you can do is you can just, you can not optimize it. That's one way. The other approach you can do is you can break it into those like silos that I talked about. Kind of like the Gmail approach, where you've got your email in one, and then you've got your contacts in another. Basically, wait till they go to a new section before you load that stuff up. And that works just as well. OK. Thank sure. you. I was wondering about uh, validation. So I didn't see any with your data banding, but I was wondering if there's any possible or what, what were you using? Yeah, so there's lots of ways to validate. The question is, how do you validate? Let me show you a quick example here. So we're inside of here. And we've got, let's say, uh, we switch your view, please. Let's go ahead and wipe out the title. Uh, John, switch your. Uh, oh, I'm your not projector. showing it, am I? Sorry. Can't you see my laptop from behind <laughs> everything? No, I, I don't have your skills. <laughs> Wow, he's a comedian. <laughs> All right, so we press save. Oops, title is required. Um, we can also do like select, I think I can unselect things. Let's try this. Yeah, so I'm actually doing multiple validation. What I'm doing, it's not completely automated. What I did is Breeze will tell me, it'll read my metadata, because I've told it things are required. And then I can also set up custom rules like min length and max length, things like that, or any rule you want, uh, multiple fields in a validation. And then when I press save, I wrote a little line of code to say, Breeze, go validate. And then it tells me there were errors. And then I pop it up in a message, and I stay on the screen. If you want, you can also tie into the HTML5 validation. So you can use, there's a library called knockout.validation, which will actually look at the same metadata, and it will like, display it in the HTML for you. And I've used that before, too. Yeah, I know about knockout validation. I was wondering, because I didn't see it in your, uh, in your new get packages. I was wondering as well. But yeah. Breeze allows you to do some metadata. Uh, that's, uh, that sort of stuff? Yeah, Breeze will read the metadata. So if you're using Entity Framework, it's actually even easier. That's the easy path. Using Entity Framework, any metadata that comes with the client, it'll automatically scan that and read it. And then you can add and extend your own properties. So for example, if I find my project, and we go down to, I think it's my models. Inside the models, you're going to see this thing called Create Reference Check Validator. I create my own validator to say, that's where if I select something in the drop-down list that's not a valid value, I'm making sure they select something. You're going to create a session. You need to be in a room. So that's going to check that for me. Another one is, let's see, did I put them all there? I think, I, I think that was the only one I made here for custom. But that's what's happening here to make sure you select something. And then I just call a method to say, go check all the validators. All right, good. Thank you. Sure. Left. Uh, can you speak a little bit about Node.js and its relation to the hot towel stack? 
Speak about Node.js, its relation to Hot Towel Stack. Comparison, contrast. Well, you could use, if I was going to use Node.js, it would probably be an option I would use for the server side for, for it. So you could set up your own web server on the back end. I mentioned earlier you could actually put Hot Towel on top of anything. You could actually do that, and I've had a couple people try it. Works out great. Hmm. Uh, you can also use Node.js to automate the creation of templates using Hot Towel and Durandal. Actually, the Durandal people have done some of that as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily compete with it. It just kind of enhances it based on what you want to use. Thank you. Sure. Um, on the uh, Breeze.js, is there, uh, when you first import it, is there like, do you have to wire it up with Entity Framework? Is there like a config file or something where you point it to, or how does that work? It's magic. Breeze is magic. Didn't you see the dog with the ears? <laughs> so how, I think your question is, I see two things in there. One is, how do you get Breeze to work? Right. With Entity Framework is one question. And then what if you're not using Entity Framework is probably the next question. So Breeze, if you're using Entity Framework, the first call it makes is out to something called metadata. So let's go back to the first page. Yes, I want to cancel the changes. Let's open up the developer tools. And then if I refresh under XHR, the first call up here is metadata. It's actually reading all the information about the entities and their properties that Entity Framework exposes. So that's how it knows about all that stuff. If you're not using any framework, this does, it's automatic with any framework. But if you're not using any framework, you can still get the metadata. You, didn't, you have to send it back, though. So you're at your own custom back end. You'd have to send it the metadata so Breeze can do it through like a web API service. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Hi there. Hi. Uh, at the beginning of uh, speaking about Durandal, I think you said something about uh, bundling. All bundling. Views. Yeah. It sounds a little, little bit scary for me that you send everything to the clients? What do you think about this? What do I think about bundling and that it's scary? Yeah. Uh, I mean I, that uh, it will be, uh, you know, the start of the application will, will take, can take a long time, yeah? Yes, it can take a longer time. Uh, in an application, if you're going to write an application with a thousand screens, I probably wouldn't want to bundle everything. Probably wouldn't. It really depends. I have a philosophy on performance. I wouldn't necessarily worry about it until you see an issue. If you see an issue with it, bundling it and loading it, and the startup time's too long for you, that's when I'd go back to what the other gentleman asked about, where I'd break it out into multiple bundles. I'd still bundle, but I'd probably do manual bundling with something like uh, Grunt or uh, Squish It or the ASP.NET bundling modification, and then just call those individually. OK, thank you. Sure. Yes. How easy do you think would it be to integrate with existing web application built uh, strictly with the Razor View engine? That's a good question. So how quickly is it to integrate like spa type stuff into an existing app? Mm -hmm. So I've had a couple customers to talk. Uh, they had a Silverlight app. And they wanted to start putting and replacing pieces of the Silverlight in their web app. And it was an interesting problem. Like, well, yeah, theoretically, you should be able to take little pieces at a time. And they've been going through that, and it's been working out good. So the key is to make sure that as you add the features in, you know when you're loading Silverlight versus um, your SPA. Or if you're doing it into static HTML or just standard ASP.NET, that works too. It's actually pretty easy to do. The, key, the big stumbling block I see people hit, though, is sometimes they're using Razor to load the screen. And then on that same screen, they want to use Knockout and Ajax. And you, you don't have to choose, but when you start using both, you don't want to load the data from two places. So I would recommend to make it easier if you can. Things are already using Razor and HTML, let them go. That Razor's great. But if you're going to use Knockout and Ajax and Spa 2, use that for the new stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't like rewriting any code I've written. So. <laughs> I think we're a couple minutes over, but I appreciate you guys coming. And if you have other questions, I'll take them in the hallway. <laughs>